Welcome to the RPF Conversation. I'm James Murphy, Chief Executive of the Royal Philharmonic Society. These are extraordinary times for us all, and particularly for the performing arts. We've created this new series of short conversations, especially for classical music lovers. Right now, you're likely hearing a tsunami of animated advocacy from all sorts of voices, each speaking out for music, whilst in lockdown, it can hardly speak for itself. Yet, on the other hand, you may be wondering how all that squares with the unlimited luxuries of classical music still bringing us so much comfort from our radio stations and streaming services, not to mention the deluge of inspired performances musicians are sharing with us all from home. Our intention with these conversations is to cut through some of the noise and try to give music lovers a candid, sincere and human impression of how music makers are faring through all of this. Today, we're talking opera and its impact on Britain's proud operatic heritage. We hope to give you a glimpse into what happened the moment opera, opera production suddenly came to a halt. We'll look at how opera has spoken and resonated in potent and surprising ways during lockdown and ask how it might return and how it may change in light of all of this. Joining me are four guests whose lives are dedicated to making and sharing opera. Sir Antonio Papano, music director of the Royal Opera House. Soprano Elizabeth Llewellyn, who's gone from singing title roles at the New York Met and an English National Opera to finding herself the last three months at home in rural Yorkshire. Lorna Price, head of costume at Scottish Opera. And the tenor Tristan Lear Griffiths, who sung himself with Scottish Opera and lives in Cardiff. Thank you all for joining us. We've lots to talk about, um, but I wanted to ask first, what were you in the midst of working on when lockdown began? Um, Tony, maybe you can kick off. Well, I was in the middle of a run of Beethoven's Fidelio, a new production, and uh, there was a lot of uh, hype around it, but especially um, around the fact that we were doing a live cinema performance, which was to be the last performance of the series. Um, and <laughs> we didn't get to do it, unfortunately. Um, because it was uh, on the Monday that the perf the uh, the lockdown or the stopping performing started, and the performance was on the Tuesday, on the seventeenth of of March, I believe, and that was a it was a really a tough blow, I must say, because there were a lot of people who hadn't come to see it in the theatre and were you know dying to see it uh, in the cinema and. Um, and then when you think that it's gonna, it was going to be shown in 1500 cinemas worldwide, when you think about that number, it's just amazing. So it was a terrible opportunity lost, but of course uh, the circumstances uh, were what they were. I have to say though, what, that we were all surprised that we were performing as long as we were, because the week before was looking quite dark. I actually finished performing myself on the Sunday um, with the LSO, I did a concert and I finished with um, Vaughan Williams' uh, Sixth Symphony, which has a very, very disturbing and unusual final movement, which is all in pianissimo and very post, shall we say, post Holocaust, post uh, terrible happening. And it's, it's extremely desolate and it kind of set the tone <laughs> for what was to come. But um, yeah, that, that's me. <laughs> Um, Elizabeth, what were you doing? Uh, I was in Germany, actually, in the middle of a run of Aida, and it was a bit verditastic because I just finished Louisa Miller and flown back to Germany to uh, sing one performance of Aida, and then the following week we were meant to be having um, rehearsals for the Verdi Requiem and doing two performances of the Verdi Requiem and then another performance of Aida. And... I think we, no, we didn't have the Generalprobe. We, um, uh, that was when we uh, were called to a general meeting and every, we were told that everything was shutting down, all schools, venues, restaurants, everything would be closed. And I had to, from that meeting, uh, find a flight back to the UK uh, early the next morning. Um, so you never got to do the first night? Uh, no, we'd already done something like, uh, six, um, I was very lucky, we'd already done about six of the nine performances and it just so happened that because there was a big gap between 
numbers seven and eight, they decided to put a Verdi Requiem in the middle. Um, pretty much with the with the cast, we had um, our Amneris and you know Radames and things. So we we had we had the soloists to do it. Um, uh, we just didn't. We we had wonderful rehearsals of the Verdi Requiem up until that day, that Thursday, uh, and then Thursday evening, well, Thursday, the Genahal Pobo was cancelled and um, we were called to a meeting. And then on Friday morning, first thing, I was on a flight home. <laughs> uh, so it was all very odd. And I, I know that they were grieving because they were really looking forward to it. The Aida had been sold out, the, therefore the Verdi Requiems were also sold out. Um, and, uh, everyone was singing their A game, so we were really excited. And then it didn't happen. Um, and everyone had to go home, literally. Tristan, I think you were, you just started a run, you did one performance, was it? Yeah, we'd just done the premiere of Alcina out in, uh, out with National Opera de, de Lorraine in Nancy. Um, we'd done the opening night on the Wednesday. And I think on the Thursday, on the Friday morning, Macron had done a speech, I think, which meant like you, were, you weren't allowed to have more than, was it a hundred people in the audience? So that took it out of everybody's hands then. So all the rest of the other performances was canceled, unfortunately. So spending six weeks out rehearsing um, a brand new opera uh, and then only getting to do one performance oh. was, Gutting feeling, really, but at least, at least we had one performance to, to look back on. But, uh, and yeah, so, I I found a flight and came straight back to Cardiff then before um, anything more serious as locking down the country came into place. So um, I was lucky I got back in time. And how do you folks? Do you just step out of an opera? Is that possible? Um, do you just step out of character? Do you just? Is it just in your head, in your, your ecosystem for days afterwards? Well, yeah, spending six intense weeks, you know, uh, blocking, blocking Alcina from, you know, from start to finish, it's, it's in you for, it's been in you for six weeks and then it's not that easy to come out of it, you know, um, because there's still adrenaline in a way um, going around your body for, well, for me it was like, at least two weeks, I was thinking about it all the time and thinking, oh, what a shame. We only got to do one performance. But um, you have to look at the bigger picture, really. And um, it was for the best. Um, and, well, hopefully it'll clear up soon, but doesn't look likely at the moment. And, and Lorna, it's not just the musicians who are invested in a lot. Where were you? What were you in the middle of? Um... Um, yeah, well, we were actually in, a, um, in the middle of a really busy season. We'd had, um, we just finished Nixon in China, um, which was a fabulous production. And we had um, Midsummer Night's Dream, which was about to go into the theatre. Um, and we, we were going to do it to a dress, um, dress rehearsal, but even that got cancelled in the end. And then um, in the wardrobe, we were actually uh, a week away from costume fittings for our principal singers or... Uh, production of um, gondoliers um, so and that was all 18th century costumes so these these were huge huge costumes you know really big panniers and stays big big production um, so yeah we just suddenly had to stop we didn't even get we didn't get to, to fit anything at all um, which was gutting because you know I started buying fabrics for this back in November um, and my team had been working on it for you know uh, like four or five months so um, it was a shame. It's a real shame. Are there just are there just sewing machines left um, with, with with costumes in them? Do these things? No, <laughs> no. They gave us a, a couple of days to clear up. And actually, when 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 we actually first finished, um, we were thinking that we could actually take stuff home. So quite a lot of stuff came home, and because it, it was before the whole furlough thing, um, so we were um, making bits and pieces, still finishing off bits of trim, just in case you know that we actually did get back within the next six weeks. Um, uh, but clearly that didn't happen. So, no, we, we, we had a, a good tidy up, um, but it's, it was just a shame. It's such a shame. So I, I wanted to ask each of you, what, how do people with opera truly in their blood, like yourselves, how do you continue finding a way to be operatic in lockdown? Or do you simply not? Um, how have any of you been able to do that? What have you found yourselves doing? I think um, 
for any artist um, to just stop and um, I mean the circumstances are awful but the the uh, the opportunity to to stop and take stock and to think you know what am I doing how am I doing it um, what can I do better um, you know, and the rest that your body or your and your voice and or your voice get um, are, are are positive things. You know, we must say this. Mm -hmm. The thing is, and and although we've had lots of time, you'd think you know all of a sudden you you know I'm I mean I, I live my life at two hundred miles an hour. All of a sudden to got to put the brakes on, slam the brakes on, it's a zero. Um, I found it very, very difficult mentally, physically. I didn't know who I was. And, and yet I was having to be very busy because of the edit of that and the DVD of this has to be prepared and, and a recording edit has to be done. And there was a lot of sort of frenetic activity at first. And then you settle into a rhythm. But I think every artist needs, needs moments of introspection and, and time to think. Mm. That part has been good. Of course, you know, the many musicians who are in, in real trouble right now in terms of, uh, uh, you know, who don't have the possibility to, to go on a furlough scheme that keeps, that keep, that guarantees their job and who, you know, these freelancers and these kinds of musicians, this is really tough. Mm. And, you know, um, and I think there was a hope, I don't know about the rest of you, but there was a hope that the beginning that this, this won't last very long. You know, you want it to, to it, it's, it's going to pass. Something's, some miracle is going to happen. And then, you know, you realize that you're in this for the long haul. That's, that's, that's very, very um, tough to deal with. Um, and you, of course you can start, you can study and learn things and you do what you can, but you know, you know, what's happened, what's really happened is that a different culture of work has, has, uh, sort of developed what we're doing right now i mean i don't remember doing it before um the the i'm doing these clips for the for the royal opera house um website and it's sort of informative analysis of scenes virtual duets with people i'm i'm trying to do something that is that has an educational thing going for it because I think that's very, very important right now. We have to try to feed our audience who are very, very hungry. The people who come, who, who support us are people who love music. They love art. They love, they love the experience of community, of coming into a theater and sharing all that. You know, so um, give them something, you know. But at some point, we've got to get back uh, to, to what we do and at the moment it doesn't look great certainly economically uh, it doesn't look fantastic to getting back to, to normality and all normality will be based on whether the government uh, comes through and gives us a lifeline so that we can survive through the period through December I would say if we can get that far then there's a chance that normality might kick in, you know, or some kind of normality. In between, we're trying to reinvent ourselves. We're trying to do smaller things, trying to imagine smaller things. Um, the streaming that is being done, uh, even with a, you know, with a nominal payment from the audience, um, that's happening. These are new initiatives. Um, will some of this stay when we get back to normal? Well, maybe. You know, when I see the numbers of the people who watch the um, the broadcasts of opera, you know, seven hundred thousand. You know, that's that's a lot of people. You know, um, for certain ones, you know, it's 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 quite amazing. And uh, um, so we're going to have to reconcile ourselves to and really focus and and bite the bullet and say what is good about this period in all senses, individually and communally and work really, really hard to, to convince people and to make sure that the science is right so that we can, that, that they're giving us the real information, uh, the true information 
that is not based on fear, but is based on, on actual facts um, so that we can get back, get back to work sooner rather than later. Yeah. Sorry, that was a very long <laughs> No, that's done. We're, we're done. Thanks all. Um, it's been nice talking. No, that's, that's great. <laughs> No, I think I think it's not just the government. It's also the the British people. If there's a second spike in an infection, or we still haven't had flu season either. I was talking to a casting director the other day, and uh, they were concerned that these two things are still potentially ahead of us. We hope there won't be a second spike, but we've still got to get through flu season. And I was asking about a, a, a production I'm meant to be in, in starting at the end of January and running through February. So much, and you know, they they uh, made this point that actually so much depends on whether we're legally allowed to to gather um, and to rehearse, and that is completely out of our hands. It's it's about the British people doing what the government sort of says and sticking with the rules and and trying to avoid this second spike because I think that will be the thing that will trip us all up um, if that happens. We hope it doesn't, but we, we've got to be realistic about how desperate people want to get back to their normality. Um, yeah, I would say just uh, for me, <laughs> I'm I'm probably not your typical artist because um, I was delighted <laughs> when it all came to a halt. That sounds kind of perverse, doesn't it? But I I was because I haven't been home since goodness since March, uh, pretty much 2019, uh, bar a week here or a few days there. I hadn't seen the inside of my home for the best part of a year. Um, and I wasn't due to see my home until the end of May um, this year. So it, the idea of being home for more than a few days was an absolute delight for me. Um, I've lived here four years and I haven't really, I've been away more than I've been here. Um, because of my work and so I think my I had my big wobble a few weeks ago um, because that whole reaction to the situation that we're in was for me was delayed because I was so delighted to be home um, and so delighted to be able to work in my own way in terms of learning roles and working on my technique and things like that um, being able to sleep in my own bed for the first time in nine or so months um, uh, and not have to think I've got to pack again next week. Uh, being able to go for long walks and just being able to enjoy my home. I hadn't been able to do that since March 2019. Uh, and so, it, yeah, I think my reaction was delayed actually. But you've had enough of all that now. You wanted to get that. Oh out. no, 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 not at all. But I think, you know, I think we were, we've all. I've spoken to other friends around the world uh, who are opera singers, and we've all sort of grieved at different times. And for some, the grief was immediate, and and uh, it, it, it was real and devastating. And for others, it took a few weeks before that started to 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 creep in and and for us to see the enormity of it for me personally it took it, it, it up until a few weeks ago i would genuinely say i was fine because i was having the break that i probably needed actually um vocally mentally uh physically and um yeah, I, it wasn't until a few weeks ago that it really hit me that uh, friends who were saying, when is your industry going to go back? I said, well, come back to me in about six months. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, make it six to 12, because we don't know what's going to happen in terms of the pandemic, second spike, what have you. Um, and we will probably be the last ones back to that normal. Um, yeah. Tristan and Lorna, um, It'd be great for you to tell us each now about how 
you know, what you found yourselves doing that may have felt initially like sort of surprising departures, but maybe looked at in a different way could be very true to kind of the spirit of opera makers. Um, so Tristan, I mean, obviously, the urge to just keep singing in some regards, see it, saw you step out onto your street and start singing to the neighbours. Just tell us a little bit about how that happened. Um, well, straight away after I came back from France, um, the clap for carers had just started. And um, one night on the Thursday night, I'd just gone out for a run, uh, just to clear my head really, because I'm, I'm a full-time daddy daycare now for, for the past 14 weeks which is another level of stress. Um, and I've got to admit that I'm a bit fed up now, to be, to be honest with you guys. It's, um, it's so lovely to spend so much time with my daughter. But again, it's time. I, 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 want, I want a further goal to aim for now. I was clinging on to my last contract um, that was supposed to be with, with Scottish Opera now, singing Ottavio in Giovanni. But last week that got cancelled. So, um, so that kind of that's where my heart kind of sank a bit because I didn't have anything else past that. So, um, yeah. But coming back and going out for a run to clear my head um, one night, and then the clap for carers had begun. So um, the clapping had started, and then my wife and my next door neighbour mm -hmm. kind of knew I'd just come back from singing from in France and they said, go on, give us a verse of, of something. <laughs> so it was, I was still out of breath actually after the run. So I gave a quick rendition of a, of a Welsh hymn. And then the following week, clapping had finished. And then I could notice that people were hanging around a bit more. And then this wasn't planned at all. And then every week I kind of, sang something then every week so it varied from welsh hymns to stuff like also le mio and popular stuff like that then so um it kind of went a bit crazy really i love this sense of kind of like you know opera can't help itself it's it, 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 it's like a this kind of entity that needs to find its audience one way or another it needs to get out there and and and, and meet the community um yeah well personally personally it kind of gave me a goal for the week because Everything had stopped for me apart from looking after my daughter. And then on a Thursday night, it kind of gave me a kind of a bit of an excitement. It led up to a Thursday night like, oh, I'm having that feeling again of uh, the feeling you get when you, when you actually perform. Um, and actually, I got quite nervous <laughs> when I saw all the street, uh, well, the street was filling up and I was like, oh God. <laughs> I have to be on my A game now because people, you know, they're with their cameras and everything goes on social media. So, um, yeah, I stopped running before uh, Thursday night then. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lorna, so, Lorna, like, I mean, pretty quickly, you sort of like, you found something else to do that had a sort of real civic quality. I think while so many of us in classical music have been thinking, what can we do? How can we, how can we uh, evolve um, in this moment? You were out there again, proving how opera makers can give to society in different ways. Tell us what you've done. Yeah, well, we found ourselves making um, a whole load of scrubs for the NHS. I mean, it's one of those things, you know, it's like we have a, a, a transferable skill. We, we can make 18th century costumes, so of course we can make, so, you know, glorified pajamas. Um, so, um, yeah, it was actually um, our tailor, um, Ali Curry, who'd seen a Facebook page um, from a group called For the Love of Scrubs. I think there's been lots all over the country. Um, and, uh, all of our, um, I, have, I have a lot of contract um, workers and they were all signing up for this group and uh, I was looking at the emails thinking well actually do you know it'll be much more effective because I am a Bossy Britches micromanager <laughs> if I um, actually get in contact with the company and go into work and use the workspace and uh, have free cuts it's just cutting and then we you know deliver them all off to our makers who are all working at home um, so uh, I got in contact with the company and they said, yes, absolutely, we can let you in a couple of days a week. And then I think, it's, I think we ended up with 2,200 kilometres um, fabric. Not, not kilometres, no, metres of fabric, get that right, Lorna, otherwise it is a hell of a lot. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, it was a lot. We made 820 sets in about four or five weeks um, of scrubs for the NHS. Um, and actually... Last, last weekend, I had a lovely letter from 
uh, the Royal Infirmary in Glasgow from the um, ICU and just saying thank you so much for supporting us. So it was a great thing to do. It was really worth it. Um, but it wasn't actually just the costume department. Um, Marion Colune in, uh, in our props department, uh, who's the head of props, she also got all of the other people who were in our technical um, uh, pr production uh, facility, um, all the people who don't sew, and they were making face shields. Um, and they made just over 9,000 face shields. So basically, our, the whole of Scottish Opera were, were, you know, just doing what we do best, which is making stuff and actually solving problems. So I think right. you know, that's, the that's, awesome. that's what we do, you know. Yeah. Can I just ask, though, I just have to ask, though, like, given that you're used to making fabulous, extravagant costumes, did you, like, like succumb to the urge to bling them up in any regard? <laughs> <the sequence? laughs> uh, no, we would, we, to be honest with you, we were working a bit too fast. We put a nice little, um, one of our, our labels in there, of, of course, so that whoever was wearing them knew that we'd made them. Um, but uh, no, you couldn't really. There were, there were such specific standards that they had to be made to. I mean, even the actual... The, the weight of the cloth that was used, the NHS are really quite specific um, that it has to be 195 GSM, um, otherwise it's too lightweight. So, uh, yeah, the, you know, it would have been nice to have, have popped a few sequins on. Not that you get many of <laughs> <or> not. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't. <laughs> what, we, what I think we're seeing here, though, is, you know, this, uh, just despite the sort of the, the, the the horrors of this moment. It, it, it's, it's sort of helping recast opera. We've known the people in this conversation that opera has always, you know, had a lot to give to its community. And all the opera companies with which you work have thriving education departments and do great, great things in that regard. But I mean, straight away, you know, going out and singing in the streets and getting that response. Uh, people who make opera, making things like the scrubs for the community. Um, for me, it's a nice reminder of um, of this thing that we have has more universal properties than perhaps we sometimes remember. Um, and also, if you go back to when this all was sweeping our way a few months ago, you know, one of the first things that really struck me was everyone singing opera on balconies in Spain and Italy. And another thing that really struck me was that when we were all fastidiously asked to wash our hands back at, um, in February and March, the way to ensure that we did it long enough was to sing. And this idea of singing and, and everything around singing actually being much more central to the fabric of our society than we thought. I mean, what would you each say to that regard? I mean, you've obviously always felt this is why you do what you do, that the opera is part of the community. But it's exciting, is it not, in some way to see it making that case again? Well, you've just <coughs> mentioned the word singing, and it seems that that seems to be the big uh, stumbling block, doesn't it? I mean, now they're, they're saying you can only have six singers together singing. So that decimates the whole idea of the chorus. Um, this is, it's not clear to me that the, uh, what the actual exposure is and what the droplets, the emission of droplets or some kind of spray for that, I hear different things. I mean, if you if you talk to people in in Germany or Austria, it's one thing. If you talk to people here, it's another thing. And uh, that's what I meant when I said before that I I hope we get the science right because it seems very contradictory uh, um, to other information from other places. So singing is actually the stumbling block. So it, it's that's what we're prohibited from doing. I mean, you know, they're saying. I think it came, there was a statement, and I, I don't know who it was by. Uh, yeah, it's fine, musicals can come back, but, uh, but no singing. Okay, so you know, I mean, how is that possible, you know? I mean, and, and it, it, it shows you how, what a huge thing singing actually is, and what a, what a part of the, of the business it is, whether it's opera, whether it's, uh, whether it's pop music, whether it's uh, pantomime, musicals ever everything you know so that's that's also why we're paralyzed um you know there's the problem of the audience which is not is it's not clear how to handle so many people coming into a building and i know i was very happy to read that um andrew lloyd Webber was trying something in the palladium which he uh did in korea having to do with how to clean a place how to prepare a place for getting more for getting audience in and um i'm glad that somebody that high powered is 
really doing an experiment to, to, to push back against some of the vague or unclear or contradictory science that is out there. Mm. Uh, because just to say no singing, well, you know, then a whole um, industry, the music industry will fall apart. And that has huge economic ramifications for a place like, like London, but not only the main cities all over England where culture is um, England and uh, of course, and, and the United Kingdom, um, where culture plays such an important part in the society. Mm -hmm. So we've got to sort that out is what I'm saying. To get, yeah. to get some real information that is not just about covering ones behind, you know, so as we, you, you know, so we've got to be seen to, to be preparing for a second uh, outbreak of the, of the COVID-19. Of course, that's a serious business, but you can also be very serious about how you try to tackle the problem. To just say, we can't tackle the problem is unacceptable to me. Mm. Um, as Lon already said, you know, in opera, you're used to solving problems, and, and this particular problem um, needs help um, from beyond the opera community. Um, We've a lot more to talk about. Do stay with us as, as we look at some more of the stark realities that are facing opera right now and how it might get going again and what fresh opportunities the current crisis may present. <laughs> 